Hello and thank you for joining us for this edition of Stratford Talks, our monthly podcast focused on geopolitics and world affairs. I'm Ben Sheen. And I'm Serena Reiser. And we're your hosts for the show. So in our podcast today, uh, we have two segments. In the first segment, we'll be talking to Stratfor's science and technology lead analyst, Rebecca Keller, about some of the developments we've seen in disruptive technologies and why specifically we look at science and technology. And in our second segment, we'll be joined by Stratfor's Sim Tak, who will be talking about our focal point satellite imagery based product and how we actually construct that and the methodology behind it. Becky, my first question has to be, what are we looking at currently in terms of science and technological developments? So our definition of science and technology and the areas that our our responsibility covers include a vast array of technologies, because technology can be anything from the tractor that tends the fields to the rocket that's sending a satellite up into space. So we literally cover everything from ground to the stars. And so we're looking at a number of different things. We're looking at advancements in material science and in 2D materials like graphene. We're looking at how drones are being used in agriculture to improve um, and the efficiency of agricultural techniques. We're looking at gene editing techniques and how they can improve the healthcare field, how they can improve biotechnology. We're looking at batteries and alternative technologies. We're looking at a number of different um, disruptive technologies that could potentially change how the world works in the future. And I think that's really good to mention because one of the questions we sometimes get is clearly we have a big focus in science and technology, why? And it fits very well into our overall geopolitical framework for the reasons you just mentioned. Because actually, you know, we talk about the limitations imposed by geography, but through science and technology, it's a way of actually breaking those bonds and moving beyond them. So what are you seeing this year that has really you know, uh, made an impact on, on your perception of emerging and disruptive technologies? So one of the things we've been focusing on a lot in the last several months is how automation um, and artificial intelligence will impact manufacturing and transport moving forward. So looking at, at how um, automation will continue to increase in manufacturing and, and how that has the potential to shift globalization away from the, the giant global market we know now to something that might be a little bit more regionalized as we see developed economies bring manufacturing back to their shores as um, robots take more of the responsibility there. And it, it seems to me that one of the most consumer-facing aspects of automation that I can think of anyway is automation in cars or transport. Right. So so automated vehicles, we've had a, a lot. Uh, Tesla has been in the news a lot recently with their accidents. Um, but what we're, how we would look at that is the potential for automated vehicles in the future. And that is to improve the efficiency of, of driving, not only for emissions, but for um, logistical issues like congestion. Um, to change how we think about transport, it's no longer, your commute is no longer lost time in your day, things like that. But when we look at that, we look at the constraints, and one of the main constraints of that technology is not the technology itself. It's actually progressing fairly consistently. Um, the techn- the uh, constraint there is public acceptance, and that's really where the, the merge of the political um, and the regulations there overlaps with the technological development, and that helps to have you know, a science mind working with a political mind. And that's a really good point, because often we have the technology to do something, but there isn't necessarily the uh, an appropriate regulatory environment to allow that technology to flourish. And recently we've seen that uh, Amazon will be testing some of its delivery drones in the UK. Now clearly your package isn't going to be dropped off by drone anytime soon, but they're already looking at a framework to enable this, even though it'll take some time. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's um, the British, uh, the CAA, the British equivalent of the FAA, um, has approved and is, will be working with Amazon um, to test the drones. And specifically, the, the important part of that approval is that they have approved the use of drones not within line of sight of the pilot, which is something the FAA has yet to do. And that's extremely important for the use of drones in delivery because you can't always see the drone and you won't always see the drone along the path. And countries that have more flexible regulations will perhaps have an advantage in the future as these technologies become more and more prevalent. So there's a couple of intersecting technologies here, especially when it comes to looking at uh, drones and remotely operated vehicles. Part of it is is the human component and how much we want to cede control to a drone, allowing it to operate autonomously. But there's another aspect as well, uh, looking at actually what, what keeps these, uh, these systems powered, which leads into the battery aspect. So I guess the first question is, are we ready yet to cede control to artificial intelligence? <laughs> so, no. 
um, the computerization um, and the machine learning aren't to that point yet by any means. Um, and when you talk about mobile uh, robotics, the battery technology is still uh, still needs to develop. Battery technology is important across a wide array of, of sectors, from renewable energy to battery powered vehicles to the robotics you're talking about to military applications. And it's all about getting um, more capacity um, and more power for less weight. It's, it's basically what you're trying to do, and you're looking at, at several different um, chemical combinations um, to to get that that kind of output. Um, lithium ion batteries are currently the 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 sort of the a high water mark for battery technology right now, and 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 that's what Tesla is using in their Gigafactory, and they're trying to bring the cost down not through new battery technologies but through economies of scale. And the, that that factory just had their grand opening. Basically, um, they're not operational yet. They should be producing if they stay on schedule by the end of the year. Um, so that's a concept that we're watching really closely. But we're also looking at, at new types of batteries because from a chemical sense, the lithium ion battery can only take you so far. There's still the problem of resource isolation. So lithium only exists in certain parts of the world. So there's still that sort of geopolitical issue that comes into light. So looking at battery technologies that have less of a resource limitation, so sodium ion batteries or organic batteries, Things that aren't as limited to their to, to a location for the raw material, and and, and using nanotechnology to, to help use these new new not new materials but different materials that we haven't been able to use before in these batteries. So looking at at how battery technology develops, so renewables become more cost effective to integrate to the grid. So we can see drones operated for much longer distances, so cars can operate for much longer distances. So that kind of thing. So you mentioned the possibility of batteries using organic materials. I mean, it's obviously more abundant than lithium, more readily available. So is that a technology in battery development that you could see catching on in the near term? Not in the near term. Um, battery development has traditionally been very incremental and, and, and slower than other technologies develop. And I don't necessarily see that changing all that uh, soon. It's easy to get the, the electrochemical the battery reaction um, to work in a laboratory environment. Scaling up is often an issue with batteries. Bringing it to a functional technology it can be an issue. Um, organic materials, organic batteries are, are a wide array. You can get, basically there's, there's the kind of organic batteries where the carbon source on one of the anodes comes from organic material, and that's one way. Um, right now graphite is actually a, a pretty common source of carbon, but other sources of carbon are possible. There's also using organic compounds, so using organic chemistry and how different molecules that occur either naturally or that are synthesized can um, then operate and transfer uh, electrons like, like the metals do now. So I won't be plugging my iPhone into a lemon anytime soon and expecting it to charge. No, potatoes might be your better bet, but um, <laughs> going back to elementary school science, but no, um, lithium ions will, batteries will be here for, for the, they will be the standard for, for the near term. Um, it's just that they won't, they're not the solution for forever. And eventually we will see an alternative solution. We might see numerous alternative solutions. But I think the common thread will be that the resources used in them are common. So there'll be sodium, there'll be magnesium, there'll be organics. There'll be something that everyone has access to or more people have access to than just the, the limited raw materials that they use now. And again, it's fascinating because we do see this confluence of events. We see how you know the actual production, uh, the mining of raw materials feeds into this, but also the technology and the manufacturing capability, the research and development, uh, and actually the funding to, to drive this. And I know that for a long time, the military was a big advancer of battery technology because um, you know, there's a lot of systems on the soldier, on the vehicle, in the air that require battery, to, uh, battery technology. So you know, clearly DARPA, other, re other government-funded research agencies drove this development. But now that pretty much everybody carries a mobile device all the time, we've seen you know huge developments driven from the commercial sector, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. I think the military still is a large driver um, in in not only energy storage but also like material science. Um, but the commercial sector absolutely has become a large driver in, in energy storage technology, especially as um, we start to think about the Internet of Things and, and how everything has become connected. That that is becoming going to be more and more the norm in our lives. So everything is going to be more and more electronic. So yes, obviously the consumer side of things will be a, a major driver moving forward, but that doesn't eliminate the military purpose. As you well know, 
military purposes for these technologies will also continue to drive um, their advancement. Well, Becca, thank you so much for being here with us thank today. Thank you so much for talking with me. And now I'm going to turn to Stratfor's SimTac uh, to talk a little bit about some of the imagery analysis we do, looking specifically at satellite imagery. Sim, you've been a real leading force at Stratfor when it comes to actually uh, obtaining and analysing satellite imagery and, you know, helping us tell a geopolitical story through the images that we're seeing from around the world. Uh, can you talk a little bit to, to your methodology and approach to this? One of the really interesting things in, in the way that we use uh, satellite imagery based on our, you know, the resources that we have. Um, we're not a, a government agency with a lot of satellites up in the air or, or any satellites at all for that matter. So basically when we get to actually collecting satellite imagery, we've already gone through a whole process of collecting open source information, talking to contacts in different parts of the world, um, and, and studying the actual topic that we're interested in. Um, and only when, when those things converge uh, with a potential uh, available imagery, um, we can put all of those together and really try to create one of those focal point products that, that really either provides evidence to an analytical thesis or that um, provides extra information that we couldn't learn without having that top-down view um, of whatever we were looking at. Well, I think that's one of the great things about it because often, you know, through our research and intelligence gathering, we, we draw certain deductions. But one thing that actually having the imagery available does is that we can show what we're talking about. We can say, okay, here is what we're looking at, here's the evidence, here's what we're talking about, and actually combine that with, with our analytic framework to, to present something visually. Exactly. And one of the big challenges in what we do at Stratfor is dealing with a lot of um, unclear or uncertain information that comes in. And really, a lot of our effort goes into vetting that information and trying to figure out which is fact, which is rumor. One of those means like satellite imagery, like that, as you say, like it gives you that possibility to get rid of the uncertainty and just say like, okay, now this is what we're seeing. When we were tracking the, the Russian deployments into Syria, there were a lot of people talking about this deployment on social media and, and, and other platforms with, with widely varying claims of what the Russians were doing inside Syria. But then once you get this picture that shows you, you know, here are the Russian aircraft, here are the Russian helicopters, here are the Russian armored vehicles, um, you immediately know for a fact like, okay, that was there at that time that the picture was taken. So if Stratfor doesn't have satellites, then where do we get this imagery? So actually we, we are working closely with a, with a partner company, it's called All Source Analysis. And these are people that actually converge satellite imagery from a whole wide variety of satellite owners. And they actually also have the imagery analysis expertise. Um, so at Stratfor is we specialize in that strategic intelligence analysis and we're not exactly specializing in at looking at a specific image and defining, you know, whether these few pixels are a tracked vehicle or a wheeled vehicle. They have people that do that and they help us um, really pick apart the image itself so that we can then combine that with our broader analysis, with our different types of sources and our, our very important geopolitical framework. So considering the bigger picture, is there anything you're looking at now more broadly that we might see come to fruition in the near future? Yeah, there's actually a few really interesting topics that we've been uh, considering and might might try tackling in a, in a fairly comprehensive way in the future. Um, one of those we've already tackled briefly in, in the past um, when we covered the, the Russian Arctic bases. Um, there's there's probably more to come on that as the Russians develop that activity and, and there's more of the story that we want to be putting out there. And then uh, another big story is the activity in the South China Sea, where, which actually provides a lot of opportunities for imagery. Um, there's already very dense coverage of that area through other publications, etc. But we, uh, we've got a particular angle that I think is going to be really interesting in exploring. And then perhaps more in the near future, one of the things we're looking at is applying imagery to really prepare, so to speak, for the, uh, the Mosul battle and, and really explore um, the situation on the ground and, and the likely course of battle while, while using this really, really great tool as best as we can. Well, that's obviously going to be a big one. And it's not just the imagery itself. We have a very advanced mapping capability as well, which will allow us to, to look at multiple aspects of the battle space when the operation goes into full effect. 
Well, Sim, thanks for uh, stopping by and talking to us about Focal Point. We'll be looking out for that in the future. Oh, no problem. My pleasure. So now we turn to our mailbag. Here at Stratfor, we get lots of emails and messages and calls from our subscribers every day. And while we reply to as many as we can, we can't, unfortunately, respond to everyone. That said, we read everything and we value the input from our readers. We'd like to take a moment now to share some input from a couple of our subscribers. In response to our piece, looking for a silver bullet against the Islamic State, Veena from Mumbai, India had this to say. As an Indian, what I see is a Western world that acts only when attacks reach their door. India has been bearing the brunt of groups like Lashar at Taiba for years and screaming itself hoarse to little effect. Using Afghanistan, the United States has pumped huge amounts of arms and aid to Pakistan and was sanguine about the collateral damage this caused in the region, as these arms and funds were used by the Pakistani military establishment to support insurgencies elsewhere in the subcontinent. We had a lot of replies in response to the Global Affairs column published by Philip Bobbitt on the Chilcot Report on Iraq. Lillian from Villach, Austria said, Sometimes you are too cautious approaching political correctness. In this case, they're considering the actors as human beings, not politicians. People are driven by motives, impulses, and people have personal histories. So with me here now is Stratford's Sim Tack to talk a little bit to that. Sim, what do you think about that? Well, actually, this, this concept of talking about people or not talking about people is one that we, we discuss very frequently inside Stratford. It's, it's one of our big themes in, in trying to shape how we address the concept of geopolitics. Now, the, the main uh, understanding of this within Stratford is that we, we try to deal with events and trends on a level that, that sits much higher than the individual, um, at a level where institutions, organizations um, sit way higher than the individual itself and basically balance out those individual motives. Um, and this is where we can start talking about constraint-based analysis, where we have um, you know, rather than the, the motive of one particular president, which is, you know, usually based very much on uh, personal gain or electoral interests, um, we can zoom out to a, a broader state system um, that has defined interests that lie in the, in the immediate sphere of that country when it comes to economy or security concerns. That being said, that the fact that we frame things that way and we, we build our our main constraint-based analysis that way doesn't mean that we completely cipher out the individual um, in our analysis or, or as we talk through these issues. Actually, one, one of the ways that we've often uh, defined our study of geopolitics is as similar to the study of human nature, you know, understanding what drives humans, what drives groups and organizations and states, because in the end, all of the actors that we do talk about, no matter which level they are at, at some level, they are all composed of individuals. So that's very clear. Thank you. And Lillian, I hope that answers your question. In response to the same article, NM from Austin, Texas, responded, I was very glad to see something that provided some rational explanation for the bits and pieces reported shortly after the invasion. Many reports were not very substantive. However, there were comments by people close to Hussein, chemists, engineers, etc., that insisted that there had been WMDs, and this was what the initial intelligence was based on. When the general media outlets failed to pursue this, I always wondered what happened. Thanks for something rational and substantive. And Doug from Logan, Utah asked, is Professor Bobbitt working on any new books? I'd be interested to see if he's doing a follow-up to his work on uh, The Shield of Achilles. Doug, I'll be honest, I have no idea, but we will ask Dr. Bobbitt and see if he's working on anything. Homer from Fairfax, Virginia wrote a response to Roger Baker's Geopolitical Weekly, facing North Korea's nuclear reality. In Homer's own words, reunification remains the primary goal for North Korea, and Pyongyang's long-term strategy to dominate the peninsula by any means has not changed. Pyongyang's continued focus of scarce resources to its large, offensively-oriented military and development of nuclear weapons and longer-range ballistic missiles is intended to strengthen its hand in achievement of reunification on North Korean terms while preventing U.S. interference. While one can argue that Pyongyang used its nuclear weapons program as a bargaining chip, they have never intended to actually trade it away. Even in the case of the agreed framework, North Korea began clandestinely violating the terms of the agreement as soon as it was signed. Clearly, regime survival, national defense, and a self-sufficient economy are logical goals. However, reunification of the peninsula under North Korean dominance is seen as essential to those goals and underlies all of Pyongyang's national strategy, policies, official statements, and media. 
For this reason, North Korea will not abandon its pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability. Well, that's all we've got time for today, but be sure to tune in next month for more Stratford Talks. As always, if you have questions or comments to share, please drop us a line at stratford.com slash podcast slash feedback. Be sure to give us your full name and an idea of how to pronounce it, as well as the city and country you're writing from. In the meantime, if you'd like to stay up to date on any of the topics we've discussed today, be sure to visit stratford.com for the latest insights and analysis. Thanks for joining us. Until next time.